you're serving on jury duty. On your case, a witness comes up, points at the defendant and says, that's the person who caused the accident. I'm sure of it. Do you believe him? Turns out memory errors are very common. So common that it's a whole field of study in the, psych in the field of cognitive psychology. False memories are memories of things that didn't happen. We all have false memories, we just don't know it. And I've picked a couple of examples here of influential false memories. So the top one is a guy by the name of Brian Williams. Uh, he was the head news person at NBC News. And he remembered back in 2003 that he had been in a military helicopter that had been hit by a grenade. Turns out it didn't happen. What did happen is he was in a military helicopter that was right behind a military helicopter that got hit by a grenade. So his helicopter wasn't, but the one in front of his was. Now, imagine being in a helicopter and you see the helicopter in front of you get hit by a grenade. Would you be fearful for your life? You bet. But he got things mixed up. He uh, lost his job at NBC. Why? because people said, oh, you're making stuff up, false memories. Turns out we all have them, but he didn't get that benefit of the doubt. 1996, Hillary Clinton went to Bosnia and remembers landing in an airport uh, in a country that was in the middle of a civil war. And her memory is that when they were landing, the plane was being shot at. Now, there's a picture of her from this particular trip, and you can see that dark green coat that she's wearing. It's particularly big. It's a bulletproof vest. And you can see all the people standing around her. What are they wearing? Bulletproof vests and bulletproof helmets. Everybody there is scared. They're, a sniper is going to shoot them and kill them. Hillary was wrong, right? Her she had a false memory. She believed that her plane was under fire. Well, it was a threat of being under fire. It was certainly the threat of being shot to death, but she got the particulars wrong in a way that was a false memory. Many people um, held that against her. Uh, the final picture on the bottom is then President George W. Bush on September 11th, 2001. This is the moment where he learns that a second airplane has flown into the second World Trade Center in New York City. So this is a moment that he discovers that the first accident, the first plane crash was not an accident, that this is intentional. Now asked later when he was told um, that the second plane had hit, um, uh, President Bush says, I was sitting outside the classroom waiting to go in. I saw an airplane hit the tower. The TV was possible, was obviously on. Okay, that is a false memory. That is not where President Bush was when he found out about the second plane hitting the tower at 9-11. This is where he was. But what happened after this moment? He watched TV over and over again, like we all did, right? Um, seeing the plane hit over and over again. So he, his memories got mixed up. These are three professional people talking about uh, events that they witnessed um, emotional events that they witnessed, and they, their memories about those events were wrong. Those were false memories, but we all have false memories. Just because somebody has a false memory doesn't mean they did it intentionally. Okay, now those were all emotionally charged events, and cognitive psychologists use the label flashbulb memory to talk about our memories for emotionally charged events, because it turns out Many of us have the experience that when we see or hear something really dramatic, it feels like our memory or the picture in our head or the sounds in our head of that event feel really true and clear and vivid. That's what a flashbulb memory is, right? It's um, uh, usually memories for emotionally shocking events and they feel very vivid. For a long time, people assumed, researchers assumed too, that flashbulb memories are more accurate than regular memories. But it turns out flashbulb memories are actually less accurate. 
They're more likely to be false memories than regular memories. And we're going to talk about that now. Why is it we, have, we experience memories of events that didn't happen or didn't happen in the way that we remember them? Well, it turns out that every time we retrieve a memory out of our brains, that process of retrieving it makes the memory very malleable, very easily changed. And it turns out every time you recall a memory, you change it a little bit. Um, and how do you change it? You filter out the stuff that doesn't make sense to you, um, and you add things that provide context that make more sense to you, given where you are now. So I have a picture here of um, a, the Tooth Fairy. I don't know if when you were a kid, the Tooth Fairy visited you, but in some homes, there's this thing, it's like the Easter Bunny or Santa Claus. It's this belief that there's a little fairy and when children lose a tooth, they can put the tooth under a pillow and a little fairy will come down during the night and take the tooth and replace it with, well, in my day, it was a dime or a quarter. I'm sure it involves dollar bills now, but um, that's a tooth fairy. So my question to you is if you grew up with a tooth fairy, can you really remember what it felt like to believe the tooth fairy was real? Can you really remember what it felt like not to be able to read. No, no, we can't remember those things because each time we recalled them, we changed them. So recalling memories, talking about memories with other people changes those memories. And that's called the misinformation effect. It's when we incorporate misleading information into our memories for an event. Misinformation effect is just another way of saying when memories are changed. We like to believe that memories are like a photograph, that they're clear and crisp and they don't change, but it turns out our memories change all the time. One of the things that changes our memory is how we feel right now. This is a bias. So it turns out you, how you feel right now and your worldview right now shape your memories from the past. So um, there's a, a great example is I've got a, a little fisherman person there and they're saying the fish that got away was this big. You can't say this big, this big. Um, we always remember the fish that got away as being bigger than it was. Uh, that's part of bias, right? Um, we have essentially an egocentric memory system, a memory system that thinks we're the most special person on the world and in the world. And that egocentric bias also shapes our memory. So our memories are, are uh, episodic memories, our memories for past episodes is shaped by how we feel about ourselves right now. So, um, I also want to tell you about a classic study that says that what you remember depends on what you expect. Yeah, memories are shaped by expectancy. This is a really simple study, but it's very powerful. Um, people, the subjects in a study um, showed up at the day and time they were supposed to for their study. And when they arrived, the experimenter said, you know, you're a little early or the previous subject hasn't quite finished yet. Would you go sit in this room? And there's a picture of this room right here on the slide. Would you just sit in this room for a few minutes and soon as the next uh, subject is done, I'll bring you in. So it'll just take a second. So the person was placed in it, that chair that you see in front for 35 seconds, that's all. And then the experimenter came back took them to another room and said, ah, you were actually in the experiment. What I want you to do now is write down everything you saw in that room, that office that you sat in for 35 seconds. So they knew it was an office. They thought it was a graduate student's or a professor's office, but all they knew it was an office and they had 35 seconds, seconds of experience in that office. Okay, what happened? 30% of the subjects in this experiment remembered seeing books. But if you look at this photograph, there's no books in this room. 
Now everything's online, so it's possible to go to a professor's office and not see many books. But back when this was, uh, study was conducted in the 80s, professors' offices were filled with books. So it just didn't make sense that an office wouldn't have books in it, which is why people expected books and 30% of subjects remembered seeing books that weren't there. Many of the uh, participants in this study remembered seeing a telephone in the office. There wasn't one. Very few participants in this experiment remembered seeing a skull or a wine bottle in the room. Now, a skull and a wine bottle are not something you would expect to see in a professor's office. You might think, well, the unusual thing will stand out and everybody will notice that. Mm -mm. They didn't expect to see it, so they didn't remember it. So our memories are shaped by our expectations. Okay, let's go to court. I want to tell you about some groundbreaking research that Professor Beth Loftus at UC Irvine conducted. And it's very relevant if you're ever involved in a court case. Here's what she did. She had subjects look at what used to be movies of car crashes. Um, in the old days, you could get driver's education training in high school, in public high schools. And they would always start by showing the students movies of what happens to you if you drive too fast. So they showed us all these movies of people crashing and dying and trying to scare high school students into driving safely. So she had people watch these um, movies. And in one of them, two cars, you can see the drawing of them right here, two cars have an accident. All right. Essentially, everybody who watched the movie is now a witness to a car accident. So what Loftus and her colleagues did was later was to ask these subjects questions about the car accident they had seen. One group of subjects was asked, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? The other groups, group of subjects were asked, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? Now, in English, smashed into implies more force. Hit implies contact for sure, and a little bit of force, but smash, bam, implies force. What happened? When these subjects were asked the question, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? The speed estimates that they gave were lower than the subjects who saw the same movie and were asked, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? In other words, let's take this into a court case situation. If a lawyer asks a witness, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? That witness is going to give a higher speed estimate than if the lawyer had asked how, far, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? So attorneys can change what eyewitnesses remember. And it gets even more powerful than that. A week later, Loftus and her colleagues went back to the, a week after the study, went back to the subjects and uh, asked them a few more questions. And one of the questions that they asked was, did you see glass at the scene of the accident? And I want you to see this graph right here. The subjects who had been asked the question, how fast were the cars going when they hit each other? 14% of them remembered seeing broken glass. But of the subjects who s were asked the question, how fast were the cars going when they smashed into each other? A third of them remembered seeing glass, well more than double. So it's not that people just respond differently to being asked questions that are a little bit leading. It's that their memory actually changes. The way in which someone words a question about the event you were a witness to is going to change your memory for that event. So should you put a lot of faith in eyewitness testimony? Nope. But how about if the eyewitness gets up there and is really insistent? I'm absolutely sure I would bet my house that is the whatever person who hit the old lady. Really? Well, let's see. If you conduct a study and look at people who are absolutely certain they remembered it correctly, 
and you can check whether their memories are accurate or not, what happens? Turns out eyewitnesses who are insistent that they remember correctly are no more accurate than eyewitnesses who say, I think that's what I saw. Eyewitnesses who are correct and eyewitnesses who are wrong are equally confident in their memories, equally confident in their memories. So someone being super confident, that's the guy. It's not worth anything. It's compelling, it makes compelling theater, but it's not, it's not helpful to jurors trying to make a decision. Unfortunately, it sways them a lot. So let's think some more about cases, not necessarily criminal cases, but cases in which two people were at the same event, but they remember them differently. So this, is, this is classic with couples, right? Or parents and siblings. You might have attended the same wedding or participated in the same fight with your spouse, but you remember it differently. Why? Turns out there's a ton of reasons why our memories of the same event differ. One is that the way we understand an event when it takes place changes our memory of that event. The other is egocentric bias, right? Our memory systems are little selfish little animals and they remember everything about us really well. In fact, our memories about things we do and feel and say is much stronger than our memory for the feelings and actions and statements that, of others. Um, our mood, changes our memory. Right? Um, remembering the event and talking about it later changes our memory. And there's also this weird gender effect called the negative recall bias. Um, for some reason, women are more likely to remember their mistakes than men are. I don't know why, but there it is. So given all of that, how does anybody remain in a couple? Well, there's a couples therapist at UCLA named Andrew Christensen who looks at exactly this thing, this question. So you and your spouse may be arguing about, you know, you said you'd take out the trash. And I said, no, I would just try if I had more time. Ah, no, you said it, you said those words. Turns out what um, Professor Christensen suggests for couples is that you give up on the idea that one person has the right memory or the accurate memory and the other one does not. And instead just focus on the feelings, the issues that come up for you, the feelings that come up for you in during this event or during the fight. And um, I think it's the really important point is People have different memories. It doesn't necessarily mean that somebody is lying. It does not in necessarily mean that someone is intentionally um, uh, mixing things up. It's just the way our memories work. Our memories are not nearly as accurate as we think they are. So let's go back to the court case now. There are in the US all sorts of people who are in prison because an eyewitness, a compelling eyewitness, put them there. And as a result of that, and the advent of DNA testing, a lot of big law schools, and in our area, it's the Loyola Law School, have something called an Innocence Project, where they go back, they revisit the eyewitness testimony, and if they can, they perform DNA evidence on any um, anything related to um, the event in question. And these folks, the eyewitness, I mean, sorry, the Innocence Project has gotten many um, perfectly innocent people out of jail who were placed in jail because eyewitnesses were wrong about their memories. You can't have a lot of faith in eyewitness memory. Okay, just a quick thing, side thing I want to tell you about. Um, there's something called source misattribution. We are let's say relatively good at remembering something we have learned, but we are terrible at remembering where we learned it, right? I'm the worst. Friends will tell me things and say, hey, don't tell anybody. Like, oh, okay, I won't tell anybody. But then I'm gonna tell somebody, but I forget who told me. So I end up telling the same, the story that I wasn't supposed to tell anyone, I tell it back to the person who told it to me to begin with. 
Ah, source misattribution. It's the same reason that um, famous people who end up in the National Enquirer or some silly magazine like that um, have to sue. You might say, well, okay, uh, so the National Examiner says that um, President Obama and Oprah Winfrey were in a love triangle <laughs> with Stedman. Who's going to believe that? You could just, ugh. But they have to sue because people forget that they heard it in a trashy magazine and they think it's real. A lot of politicians take that, that use source misattribution all the time to create confusion. You just put crazy things out in the Twittersphere and people forget that the source is not reliable. Source misattribution, it's, it's something that, that really bites us. Okay. That's it. Students, there's two more slides that you can use to help you improve your study habits. Otherwise, back to Canvas. Thanks very much.